let's address the elephant in the room. This is not Moneyball. We are not looking for some golden metric that indicates success and is undervalued by the market, nor are we erroneously looking for cheap young players that we can sell on for massive profit. No, today we are going to look at how I use statistical data to filter through potential targets and identify players with the right profile for what we want to achieve at Ajax. We'll explore the pizza charts I created for the Musterman skin, how I prioritise different metrics for comparing different positions, and combining statistics to create a fuller picture of a player's contribution. Before we get started, I think it's pertinent to address the limitations both of a statistical-led approach and football manager itself. Firstly, we have no historic data to work from. When starting a new game, we need a reasonable number of competitive fixtures to be played before we can start using data to inform our decisions. When the season ticks over, stats are reset, and unless we have exported them somewhere external, like Excel or Google Sheets, they are lost forever. This can make it difficult to track player improvement without a lot of additional effort. Secondly, stats are impacted by the detail level of the league. If a league is not selected as playable, stats are not necessarily completely comparable. This also extends to youth leagues, where stats are not easily exported. All of these serve to present difficulties when trying to take a statistical-led approach, and sometimes means that you can't always rely on statistics alone to make your judgments. With that out of the way, it's time to talk about my playstyle. I disable the player search screen, instead relying on my scouts to assemble a database of potential targets. Having started the game with zero staff, this has delayed that process, and severely decreased the size of the pool I can look at. Indeed, by the time transfer deadline day came round, we had reasonable or greater knowledge on only 46 players. This means we're only going to shop for need in this transfer window, which leads us to the question, what are our needs? After four games, this is my approximation of our squad depth, where I've placed each player in the role I believe they will contribute most. I've arranged it by our in-possession shape, and labelled each position by the function they perform, as the specific formation and roles will change depending on players available in the opposition. With 12 players to cover the attacking unit, we have more than sufficient cover across our front five. Even more so when we consider that many players can also contribute to other functions should the need arise. Tardic and Kudus in particular are the first names on the team sheet, and I'd be comfortable with them playing anywhere. We are not so fortunate with the defensive unit. Just eight players cover the defensive and support positions, and we are lacking depth for the central pivot and right centre-back roles. When we look at cover, however, we have a lot more flexibility to our midfield three, and it's clear that a right-sided centre-back is the priority, especially when you consider that Timber is 5 foot 10 and Grilich is not a natural centre-back, leaving me a little apprehensive if I need to deploy either in the back line. So that will be our focus a right-sided centre-back who can provide cover for Alvarez. If we can find someone who is comfortable on the left and an upgrade on Bassi, even better. This is where the pizza charts come in. From here we can see what a player is good at when compared to their peers. Each slice is shown as a percentile, with each circle in the graph behind representing 20%. So Edson Alvarez, for example, wins 9.4 headers per 90, and that puts him in the 90th percentile, meaning more than 90% of players, whilst his 4.8 progressive passes per 90 is in the 60th percentile. This is when comparing against all players, and is the default when you load up the player profile. However, we can drill deeper and look at it by position group. Here we can see that compared to just defenders, Alvarez drops down to the 50th percentile for progressive passes. This is because centre-backs, on average, make more progressive passes, Understandable considering they play in a deeper position and so there is more space in front of them to progress the ball, compared to, for example, a striker. Let's take a look at the centre-backs our scouts have unearthed. We've filtered out those already on loan, and those who have played fewer than 270 minutes. This gives us a grand total of six potential signings. If we take a look at De Sassi here, we can see how his profile is very different to Alvarez, with him much more engaged and active in defensive actions, but much less involved in the possession game. Comparing multiple players at once, however, is an area where football manager struggles, and to narrow down our options properly, we're going to take this outside of the game. We'll export the stats and use Google's Looker Studio to create a dashboard. 
This will also allow me to combine and calculate some metrics that are not directly available in game. Whilst I use Looker Studio as it's what I'm familiar with, many FM data boffins use Tableau, so I've added a link in the description to a wonderful article by Steinkelson FM should this be something you're interested in learning yourself. On to the dashboard. Here we can see our vast array of six potential targets. In the top left here, we have pass accuracy and progressive pass rate. Progressive pass rate is just a division of progressive passes against passes attempted, allowing us to see how frequently a player looks to move the ball forward. Whilst I want any potential arrival to be comfortable on the ball, I want to be mindful that they are not always passing sideways or backwards for the sake of it. Similarly, a player with lower pass accuracy but a higher progressive pass rate indicates that they might play in a team encouraged to make more direct passes and should not be necessarily discounted entirely. Which of course means I'm going to discount them entirely. Realistically, 85% passing accuracy is my cutoff. Not only do we intend to be possession heavy, but the 2-3 build-up shape means I don't really want my centre-backs needlessly surrendering possession. That means Nelson and Nicolau are out of contention, and we're already down to just four players. The next graph shows possession won versus possession lost, or what I will often refer to as turnover differential. In many respects, possession lost has similarities to passing accuracy, but will also cover times when a player is tackled or miscontrols the ball, and I find this to be a good indicator of a player's defensive intelligence. Ideally, I prefer defenders who regain possession at least twice as often as they lose it, and that would see our trend line sit somewhere about here. That means goodbye to Alexander Hack. In the bottom left, we have two more calculated metrics. Combined defensive actions, which is the sum of tackles won, blocks, clearances and interceptions, and pressure success rate, which is the percentage of successful pressures against attempted pressures. Personally, this is the least important graph for me when assessing centre-backs. Firstly, combined defensive actions is not a measure of how good a defender is, but rather how busy they are, which is more of an indication of the tactical setup their team employs. As we intend to be on the front foot the majority of the time, we do not actually expect our defenders to make many defensive actions. Secondly, I don't know what constitutes a successful pressure, as I don't seem to be able to view this on the analytical chalkboard. Whilst I cannot see a situation where a higher pressure success rate would be a bad thing, and it's certainly come into consideration when comparing two similar players, that element of the unknown means I'm unlikely to exclude a player for it. Finally, we have header success rate and tackle success rate. This should be self-explanatory. How often players win their aerial and ground duels? I am very conscious that Edson Alvarez and Grant Bassey are both 6 foot 1, and so I'd be keen to find someone who is strong in the air. A 63% win rate is particularly worrisome, especially when you consider he also has the lowest tackle success rate, and so I'm officially ruling out Ardian Ishmajili. With two remaining, there's a clear winner. 21-year-old Mies Hilgers comes out on top on the six metrics I value most. As we dig deeper into his profile, we also see that he doesn't have a side preference and has lined up as the left-sided centre-back on occasions already this season. A minimum release fee of 14 million might seem steep, but that's probably comparable to what we would need to pay for Disassi. If we can't secure a deal for Hilgers, I'd be happy with Disassi, so it'd be ridiculous to bulk at that fee for a player I think is better. Of course, we now need to leave things in the capable hands of our director of football, Marco van Basten. A five year contract with a club option extra year, under £20,000 per week, and no yearly wage rise seems almost too good to be true. And it kind of is, because dear Marco has decided that Hilgers is a star player. To be fair, his performances to date have been very good, but he'll need to earn that starting spot first. Fast forward to the World Cup, and who am I to doubt the legend that is Marco van Basten? Hilgers has been sensational, earning a 7.38 rating in 13 games as part of a defence that has only conceded three goals when he's been on the pitch. 94% pass completion and in the 90th percentile amongst centre-backs for ball security and passes completed shows that he's slotted into our system comfortably. Of course, things don't stop there. As we head towards the winter transfer window, we are in a much better position to make judgments. Firstly, we've had 21 competitive fixtures and so have a much stronger idea of the strengths and weaknesses of our squad. 
Subsequently, my squad depth now looks like this. An injury crisis in October saw us without, among others, Dusan Tardic. Steven Berghaus was meant to be the ready-made replacement, but failed to make the impact I had hoped for, and so Kudus was shifted into the more creative role. With all players fit, I'd still prefer to have Kudus as a secondary goal threat, but I'm not likely to have all players fit for a while, and so this is an area I'd like to strengthen. With a couple of weeks until the transfer window opens, we can also consider those players in the scouting pool that we only have marginal knowledge of, as there's plenty of time for more detailed reports to follow. We've upped the minimum minutes played to 500, and once again exported the data so we can compare multiple players at once. We're going to filter this by players who can play across the front four positions, under 25 and with a maximum asking price of our remaining budget, around £12 million. I'm going to start in the top right this time, with my favourite combined metric, excitement factor. This is a sum of shots, dribbles, open play key passes and free kicks won per 90. Something I find helps me see how often an attacking player does something that might get the fans off their feet. I like to measure this against possession lost. I expect these players to lose possession. It's the accepted trade-off from trying to do something game-changing, but I want it to be proportionate. Our cut-off here is 2 to 1. For every two times they lose the ball, I want them to do one thing exciting. We're also going to ignore those players who allegedly have never lost the ball, as that indicates they're in inactive leagues with inaccurate data. This cuts our pool roughly in half, and we can start looking to break this down further. In the top left we have key pass rate, a measure of open play key passes divided by attempted passes, against average chance quality, which is expected assists divided by open play key passes. We're looking for players who don't just make key passes, but create chances of decent quality. As a result, we'll look for a key pass rate above 2%, and average chance quality above 0.10xa, which basically gives us this cluster here. Now in the bottom left, we have shot accuracy and xg over performance per 90. As a minimum, I'd expect players to hit the target at least 40% of the time, and so we're going to remove Sule and Hayes from consideration. XG performance, which is simply non-penalty XG subtracted from non-penalty goals, isn't necessarily something I will look to use as a tiebreaker, but something to consider in terms of expectations. We expect most players to regress to the mean at some point, so I want to be conscious that someone like Ilias Hamash, for example, might not be as prolific with us as he currently is at Valenciennes. Finally, we have header success rate and pressure success rate. It is not vital that the player is good in the air, but whoever we sign will still be expected to get into the box, even if they are in a more creative role. So whilst they don't necessarily need to be good, they can't be objectively bad in the air. And that means goodbye to Mishak Elia. That leaves us with four possible options, but once again there is a clear standout. Ricardo Sotil leads the way in key pass frequency and excitement factor, whilst not being considerably more careless with the ball. His effectiveness in the pressing game is attractive considering our aggressive counterpress, and it's easy to see how he becomes our preferred choice. Van Basten does the needful, bringing him in on a two and a half year deal for just under £10 million. He comes in as a squad player on £24,500 per week, which is less than half what Steven Berghaus is earning, and means we can consider moving on the former Watford man. Or at least, that was the idea. Van Basten, who's done a good job so far, intervened with a new contract that derailed my plans. It wasn't for Berghaus, mind nor was it that new. In September, he handed Kudus a five-year deal with a £58 million release clause, which Man City could barely wait to trigger. And so, Berghaus survives. The Premier League plunder didn't stop there. Newcastle came in with a £42 million bid for Edson Alvarez, and our Mexican centre-back let his feelings be known. With Bassi impressing in rotation, Hilgers can swing over to the right-hand side, and we're now in the market for a backup. Our backline is young, and so our focus here is someone with a little experience behind them. Using the same filters as before, albeit with a now wider array of players to consider, our selection here is Rayo Vallecano's Alejandro Catena. The 28-year-old is more of an active defender than our current options, and should be a more capable backup. £5 million and just over £17,000 a week, he comes in at a bargain price. It is worth mentioning that we didn't set out on this save to specifically follow a statistical-led approach alone. 
and sometimes I find it useful to throw all caution to the wind. With money burning a kudu-shaped hole in our pockets, I thought I'd take one last look at the scouting pool to see if anything caught my eye before the window closed. Mikhail Yathabal has not shown up previously because we had a minimum minutes filter applied. A damaged cruciate ligament injury had robbed him of most of 2022, but it appears that he's amenable to a move. This is 100% a case of reputation and profile guiding our decision making. Nonetheless, Van Basten does the deed, and Ajax has a new record signing. Berghaus's survival was short-lived, as he was farmed out to Juventus before the window closed. There was still plenty of the season left, and whilst Hilga seems to have been a hit, we have yet to play enough games to pass judgement on our winter arrivals. This will be something we'll have to revisit at the end of the season, perhaps along with an attribute reveal. If you've enjoyed this video or found it useful, please consider subscribing and turning on notifications for more FM-related content. Until next time.